So as um, I had the, the honor to organize this uh, symposium, so let me uh, also welcome you. Um, the, the Deutsche Bank Prize Awards to, to Eugene Fama four years ago and to Robert Schiller today exhibit uh, remarkable contrast, but also continuity. Uh, Fama championed the efficient markets hypothesis, which in many respects represents the pinnacle of neoclassical financial economics. Schiller argued convincingly that behavioral aspects can get in the way of market efficiency, thereby questioning extreme forms of the efficient market hypothesis. In the four lectures today, we will certainly experience aspects of this creative tension between neoclassical finance and behavioral finance. However, the purpose of the mix uh, in today's symposium is not to set one approach against the other uh, or to count debating points. The purpose is rather to explore how the best principles and practices of neoclassical finance, of which we uh, heard a very good example, can be informed and enriched by the findings of behavioral finance in order to understand what went wrong in the past and more importantly, in order to create promise for the future. Quite consistent with Professor Schiller's and Professor Merton's work, future promise comes from further financial innovation and application of best finance practices to the management of risks that are important for the household, such as home equity risk, inflation risk, or the risk of outliving one's retirement accumulation. A recurring question and theme of this symposium is going to be how to transform the financial market environment so as to foster rather than stifle such socially beneficial financial innovation. This takes the current policy debate one important step further from figuring out how to tie the hands of financial practitioners so that they can do no harm to unleashing their potential for promoting social welfare through management of important risks. And I think we will hear quite a bit of that in the course of the symposium. Following Professor Merton's inspired and very effective talk, we have the great pleasure today to have with us Professor Nicholas Barberis, who is going to give the second lecture. Nicholas Barberis is the Stephen and Camille Schramm Professor of Finance at the Yale School of Management. Prior to his appointment at Yale, he taught for several years at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. His research focuses on developing analytical foundations for the field of behavioral finance, and in particular, on applications of cognitive psychology to understanding the pricing of financial assets. Professor Barberis will talk to us about how insights from cognitive psychology can help us understand the recent crisis and financial behavior more generally. It's a pleasure to introduce Nick Barberis. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Haliasos, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, for the past 10, 12 years or so, I've been working in the field of behavioral finance, which, as you know, is essentially a field that Bob Schiller founded, uh, and I've drawn a lot of inspiration and encouragement from him in the past 10 years or so. Uh, it's also been a great pleasure to be his colleague at Yale for the past five years, and that's given us the opportunity to do a lot of behavioral finance events together, uh, most recently a summer school in behavioral finance for PhD students, and I've enjoyed all of these. Uh, tremendously. I should also say it's also a great pleasure to be here with Professor Merton, who was actually my first finance professor in graduate school uh, and a very big early influence on me. Um, so, you know, given that Bob Schiller is responsible for founding this field of behavioral finance and given that we have been going through uh, a financial crisis, I thought, well, maybe you could try just take a, a first stab at a behavioral finance perspective uh, on the financial crisis. So let me just say a little bit more about that. Uh, just a quick reminder of what behavioral finance uh, is about. I think you all know that traditionally when economists have tried to write down models of how the stock market works, they've used these models where everyone is rational. Uh, and that means a couple of things. It means, first of all, when you get new information, you update your beliefs correctly. And secondly, it means that given your beliefs, you make sensible decisions. And it would be wonderful if that fully explained the world, because it's a very simple and parsimonious model. Uh, but a lot of people feel that some things, at least, are not fully captured by that 
model. But there's an alternative. It's been around for decades. It's called behavioral finance, and it argues that some financial phenomena might be the result of less than fully rational thinking on the part of some participants. And it advocates reading both the cognitive and social psychology literatures to try and understand better how people might depart from full rationality. And it's been applied already to understanding the pricing of financial assets, uh, how ordinary people like us invest and trade over time, and aspects of corporate finance. So if you like, there are these two com com complementary, I would say, paradigms, the rational agents paradigm and the behavioral finance paradigm, uh, and two of the best known people on each side, and I now realize they're both Deutsche Bank Prize winners, is Gene Farmer at the University of Chicago, my former colleague, uh, and on the behavioral finance side, uh, Bob Schiller at Yale. Uh, and just like Chicago is very associated with the rational model, uh, I've been finding that in the past few years, Yale is becoming increasingly associated with the behavioral model, and I think that's in large part because of Bob Schiller, uh, but in fact there's a quite a significant group of us there now working on these issues. So, you know, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the financial crisis from a behavioral finance perspective. So I suppose that means, you know, what was, if anything, the role of less than fully rational thinking in the crisis? Could psychological factors have amplified the crisis in some way? So a very sort of, you know, very simplistic one-minute sort of sketch of the financial crisis. Um, so I guess you could say you had loan originators who made loans, for example, subprime loans to subprime borrowers. These loans were then sold on to investment banks uh, who packaged them into mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, and so on, which were rated by ratings agencies and then sold on to end investors. And I guess sort of a very simplistic view of the financial crisis is just that a lot of the subprime borrowers defaulted, so a lot of the securities related to subprime loans on the balance sheets of banks went down in value. Uh, that's a problem because these banks were using these securities as collateral for short-term financing, so it made it very hard now to get short-term financing, so the banks experienced very significant liquidity problems. And there's a couple of views, a couple of narratives you read about this uh, in the financial press. I'd say one narrative is what you might call the bad incentives view. So this view says, look, banks actually knew that there were significant problems with subprime loans, that they had a really significant risk of default, but they didn't care because their incentives just led them to keep on originating and packaging loans. The idea is something like these people were compensated on the quantity of the deals they were doing and not so much on the quality. So you do read that view a lot in the financial press, but I have to say I find quite a lot of skepticism in the academic profession uh, about this view. I think this story only works if you assume very short-term incentives. If you have a horizon of even three or four years, it seems that you would really want to scale down your mortgage-related activities, make less money this year, but make more money in future years because your bank has a better chance of surviving any potential crisis. So I think to make this story work, Work, you really need to assume a very short horizon, which seems a little too short for the leaders of many of these uh, banks. Uh, by the way, I think another difficulty with this incentives view that I've heard is, notice the theme of the incentives view, which is that you know, everyone knows that there's a big problem here with the subprime loans, but because of our incentives, we keep on with the same business model. Well, if it was so obvious that there was a problem, you would have expected hedge funds to do very well uh, by betting against subprime-related securities, for example. But that didn't happen. Very few hedge funds seem to actually benefit in that way. So I think that more points towards the second narrative we read about in the financial press, which I would call the bad models view, which says that there's nothing wrong with incentives. Banks simply fail to forecast the likelihood and severity of a collapse. Their models fail to take into account the possibility of a national downturn in housing prices. Their models neglected fat tails, for example. So I, personally, I find that a little bit more plausible, but I'm still not completely comfortable with it. Um, how could it be that all these smart, very well-trained people at these banks could be comfortable with such deficient models? doesn't quite seem to ring true. So I'm going to just merely suggest a, a kind of third possibility uh, in the first part of my talk today, uh, which is this alternative view that on some level banks were aware that there were problems with their business model, but as a result of a variety of psychological forces, they deluded themselves even into thinking that everything was fine. 
And in the last part of my talk, I'm also going to discuss some psychological factors that might be relevant to some other curious features of this crisis. For example, the lack of trading in some debt markets, this belief that everyone had that house prices would keep on rising for a long time, and the willingness of a lot of households to take out unusually large loans. So really what I'm going to do is just pick out some very big ideas in social and cognitive psychology and just think a little bit about whether they might be relevant. And I should emphasize, because I know there are some students here, what I'm presenting here is not at all a research paper. I'm going to bring very little evidence to bear on the hypotheses I'm going to mention. I'm merely going to suggest some hypotheses for future research and a little bit I want to take advantage of the crowd here today to tell me which ones you think are more plausible and worthy of future research. Uh, and if we do want to research them further, then we're going to have to develop testable predictions and go out and test them. So it's really just suggestive. 